Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Fox Valley Voice. I'm so sorry that you missed the pregame on that one. We should start doing like a members only kind of a premium feature where you get to listen in <laughs> before we start intakes outtakes yeah so um yes uh the fox valley voice uh, as i was saying this is the only live youtube show focused on the fabulous people places and events going on in and around the fox valley my name is jaime gutierrez i am your host and i am very very excited to uh welcome to the studio live and in person here today Brian Nord and Andre Sals, they are both uh, vital members of the Fermilab family, the uh, Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory in uh, beautiful Batavia, Illinois. So welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, before, we, before we get into uh, you know, the meat and potatoes of the show here today, um, anything else that we w- need to finish up from the pregame? Uh, you know, b- about movies or family history or anything. <laughs> <laughs> now I got to do my little yeah. Silent intro you were really excited to do that. We yeah. didn't you we didn't practice that or anything. You just you oh, just, I've been practicing. Oh yeah. yeah, no, I've seen it practice. Mirror every morning. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, so let's um, I don't know. Let's talk about Fermilab. It's I mean we could probably do like ten hours on 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 what's going on over there right is it more than likely it's a yeah. fascinating place absolutely and um andre is the your uh, your official title again you are the media and community relations specialist that's the title yeah it's okay basically all that means is that i talk to reporters i do the press releases i talk to community groups my job is just to get the word out about the laboratory mm-hmm. but um as far as sometimes having to translate some of the uh, the science into something that the rest of us can relate to, I, I imagine that's a bit tricky. It is, yeah. So one of the reasons that um, I, I think they wanted somebody in my position that didn't have much of a science background, and I have absolutely none. So <laughs> um, one, of, one of the reasons they wanted that is that um, my in order for me to explain anything that's happening, I have to understand it. And in order for me to understand it, the scientists have to talk down to me. They have to talk at a level that I can I can grasp so mm-hmm. uh, Brian's well aware of this we've had conversations where I've said no I don't get that at all I have no idea what you're and talking about Brian always semicolons. he pretty much talks down to everybody doesn't he <laughs> always <laughs> I actually I don't even look at you when I'm talking to you I'm usually just looking around there mm. <laughs> okay well and let's let's introduce Brian Nord and his uh, position Brian you are one of the uh, the you are a, a PhD researcher there at uh, Fermilab, tell us a little bit about what you do, and then we're going to uh, spend a lot of time getting a little deeper. But yeah, so I um, I'm a postdoctoral researcher, which means I am cool enough to have a PhD, but not cool enough to have a permanent position. Because <laughs> uh, it takes, you sound a little bitter. Uh, it's not bitter. It's just. Um, <laughs> Uh, that's the reality. That's how it is, yeah. Okay. So in, particularly in physics. Because uh, they'd cosmology. have to pay you more if you, if you had an actual position. They'd have to make space for me. And there are people who have been around a lot longer that still use that space well. So, okay. Um, but that's the, that's the state of physics right now, uh, most of science research, where people will do a few postdocs in different places before they move on. Um, but I, so barring all the, the bureaucracy, <laughs> I, um, I study astrophysics and uh, actually cosmology. So... Astrophysics is on a small scale, um, small-ish, like what's happening inside a galaxy, what's happening to a star. And cosmology is what's happening on the larger scale. So what's happening with millions of galaxies across the universe, trying to understand how the universe changes as a whole. Hmm. We, I'm going to start off the show, first of all, before, um, before we get too far into it, uh, I am going to remind our uh, listeners and viewers that uh, we do encourage uh, interaction on this show. So if you have a question or a comment for either Brian or Andre, you can feel free to uh, enter that on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Fox Valley Voice. Or if you're watching on YouTube, you can go ahead and just comment underneath the uh, the video and, uh, and we will see that and... Uh, We'll bring it up on the show. Uh, the other thing I want to start off by saying, and uh, I'm already like getting sweaty palms. Um, <laughs> the whole, the whole, for me personally, um, I, I have a great deal of anxiety when I start thinking about things that happen outside of 
basically my neighborhood, but um, <laughs> but for for sure outside this room, outside the, of this room, the planet. Okay, like when you start thinking about like stars and galaxies and universes and stuff, mm-hmm. like um, I, it like freaks me out, and I can't even barely think about it. I will go into a full uh, anxiety attack. This is going to be a great show for you. Yes. You're going to enjoy this one. No, I mean, I've already, I had trouble sleeping last night. So, um, so yeah. Well, so, so what freaks you out about it? What, uh, w- yeah, just the, um, just the, the, the enormity, the enormity and our insignificance, you know, like, you know, I'm worried about like this little, you know, like a bird pooped on my windshield, you know, and it's like really bothering me. And then you stop and think, and you're like, okay, well there's a black, there's black holes that's going to eat everything. And, and, you know, it's like, I have trouble, um, you know, consolidating that mm. information in one brain. <laughs> the re- research is a great process of reconciling your ego with the grandness of the universe. My ego has decreased in size by about a million times, uh-huh. definitely over the years. Um, I can get so hopefully today I can give you things that will make you worry more and some things that will make you worry less. Okay. I have I have a few a few <laughs> concepts up my sleeve to you, keep me from sleeping again tonight. But uh, I mean, is that have you heard of this before? Like, do you talk to people and they're like, "Oh my god, that completely freaks me out." About some of the topics that you study, I haven't heard it put the same way that you have put it. Um, <laughs> usually, people are um, awestruck. There's there's a bit of a positive twinge to that uh, feeling of fear or anxiety. Um, when I talk to a lot of kids and I I go through the steps of from the scales of our Earth out to the scales of the universe, I eventually get to a picture that shows that we've actually mapped um, million, hundreds of millions of galaxies across the sky. And when I, when, usually when I do that, there are at least five or ten kids in the audience who just go, what? <laughs> and then it looks like they are a little freaked out and their world yeah. has been turned upside mm-hmm. down. And do you have an arrow that says, like, you are here? Yeah. It's, and, it's, and then and when you point to that place where our solar system is inside the galaxy, we're basically in the suburbs in no special place. And when you, when you put that in perspective, then people are like, oh, I don't matter anymore. <laughs> yeah. Bit, which is a good thing. I yeah. Think. I mean, I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about, but I actually find that comforting. I find that um, when, when you think about your own insignificance on the scale of the, the, the cosmic, you know, the, the vastness of the cosmos, the bird poop in your windshield doesn't really seem that important. So, right. It's... But if you take if you take it too far, then nothing matters. And you're just walking around going, oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cosmo- cosmology should not lead to nihilism. Right. <laughs> yeah. You stop paying all your bills and stop <laughs> washing yourself. And, you know, it comes a Battlestar yeah. Galactica weekend. Yeah. Right. I don't, what does I don't. What does that mean? There, there's a good Portlandia skit where this couple uh, just watches one and then they get addicted and then they end up losing their entire house because they stayed in for weeks at a time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To watch Battlestar Galactica. Mm-hmm. So we'll try not to get to that point. Okay. But um, but we we will we will soldier on and uh, we'll talk about uh, what we need to talk about and and then I'll just have to go on right. medication after this. <laughs> hey, there! Lithium was made in the uh, in the early universe, and we still have it for for those reasons. For that reason, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Anti- <laughs> antidepressants. That's right. Okay. The universe created its own antidepressant, knowing exactly. <laughs> knowing that this was going to happen. That's right. <laughs> so I don't know, man. I mean, this is such a big thing to talk about. What's going on at Fermi Lab? Um, maybe we should talk about some of the some of the other events that are going on. Some of the stuff that we can look forward to here over the you know the next few months. And then, uh, and then maybe after that, we'll get into some of uh, Brian's work in uh, dark energy and uh, stuff like that. How's that sound? Sounds good. All right. Um, so, uh, Andre. Yeah. Why don't you uh, share with the class <laughs> what uh, what's new and what's going on uh, as far as uh, Fermilab is concerned? Sure, for the next couple of years at least. Um, the the big story this year is actually something that's going to happen next week, uh, and that's the Large Hadron Collider is turning back on. Mm. Um, that is the 16 mile around uh, particle accelerator that's in Switzerland, and about a hundred Fermilab people work on that, um, flying back and forth between here and Geneva, a lot of them, and. Um, about uh, 1,700 to 2,000 uh, U.S. scientists work on that as well. So this is, it's the, the biggest, most powerful particle physics machine there is. And it's been down for a couple of years for upgrades, um, uh, trying to make it even more powerful. So um, the fact that it's coming back on next week is sort of a really big deal. 
it's kind of a big deal. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> Andre the anchor man. <laughs> kind of a big deal. Sort of, sort of. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm not moved by it because of the vastness of the cosmos. You know, I realize how insignificant it is. Right. But now, is this the machine that when they turned it on uh, originally, they said that it might um, cause the earth to disappear into a puff of logic and some some people who there were some hawaiian yeah. physicists who calculated that many black holes could be created by the lhc and that the earth could be swept up into it okay. this is sort and of, did that happen uh it depends <laughs> right maybe it did and everything still survived and we're all just in the middle of a black hole i doubt that okay um yeah this these guys when when you come when people make predictions like this that no one else agrees with. It's kind of like the 1% of co- uh, climatologists who don't agree with climate change. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, and the people weren't were running around with the tin hats, the, you know, the foil hats. Uh, you know. Yeah. So you just set those folks aside. Well, you know, you do, you do have to deal with that. You do have to, to go out and debunk that as much as you can. And say, you know. Well, and the, the problem is, like you said, it may be a super small sample of, of uh, scientists and researchers that believe this, but it's the one th- theory that gets all the press, oh, of course. right? It's yeah. like, then everyone starts freaking out about it. Yeah, of course. I mean, the, 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 the way the, the modern press seems to work, or a lot of the 24-hour news networks at least seem to work, is that they, they, they take the the... The ninety nine percent are saying one thing, and the one percent they're saying the other, and give them equal weight as if there's a controversy. And there's no controversy about whether the Large Hadron Collider will destroy the world. It's not going to. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. I'm I'm glad. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can talk about what it will do if you'd like. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I mean, is there uh, what are they going to be working on here that uh, that matters to us? Sure. Uh, so Did it matter. <laughs> I get it. Yeah, yeah, good. So um, the the idea of the the collider, the why, why it is so large, is that it's going to be colliding particles at energies we've never tried before. It's going to get up to what we call thirteen tera electron volts, which is an insane amount of energy, mm. and it's going to take protons and antiprotons and collide them together at that speed and that energy. Um, the idea being the the higher energies you can get, the the more fundamental the particle you you'll get to to see when you ran them together. So that's how the Higgs boson was found a couple of years ago Mm -hmm. is they did that process at I think seven TeV something like that and uh, that we'd we'd never been able to see it before we'd never been able to to locate that particular particle and so we don't actually know what we're going to find when we get up to 13 we don't know what's going to come out of it that was going to be my question is is there something that they think is there Mm -hmm. that they're looking for like do they already have something in mind and they're just trying to find it or are they just saying hey let's just do this and see what happens (laughs) well there's a good element of that to all (laughs) physics right let's let's try this and see what happens but the things that they're looking for this time supersymmetry is sort of a big thing that they're looking for i think brian can explain that a lot better than i can uh the the whole theory behind it but i think the idea is that for every particle there's a another particle that is uh super symmetrical to it and that causes sort of a balance in the universe so this is different from antimatter we should be clear about that so there is a so protons and antiprotons are matter and antimatter and just means that um, an antiproton is exactly the same as proton except it has a negative charge instead of a positive charge Mm -hmm. Um, supersymmetric particles are very different in that um, all the particles that we have from quarks to leptons are in one um, are the are of one kind and then their supersymmetric partner has a different thing called a different spin so it's a different way that it um, abs in an abstract way rotates okay yeah and the the reason this is important is that it, it it goes beyond what the standard model of particle physics is now. And we have to do that because the standard model is incomplete. It doesn't tell us everything about the universe. Mm -hmm. The standard model is those pictures of blocks that you see with the different, the quarks, the leptons, and the forces. That's, it's our best picture of what the universe looks like now and how it works, but we know it's not right. We know it's not finished. Mm -hmm. And all of this is completely different from Newtonian physics, right? Like the stuff that you learn in high school, all that stuff like it's different in the sense that quantum mechanics is what tells us when you study quantum mechanics you understand how these particles interact and it all all of that happens on a really 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 really, really tiny scale whereas, New, whereas newtonian mechanics governs what blocks sliding yeah. down uh inclined planes yeah simpler things that's the part that i remember yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, i mean when i was in, in school and adam had three parts to it right it's proton neutron electron and that was it and mm-hmm. we've gone considerably farther than that at this point, breaking down those particles into their smaller components and finding out what makes them work. I liked it when it was easier. 
<laughs> so a, a proton and an antiproton, uh, you know, what happens when those two get together? Is it this is like a cancel out kind of a thing? or Matt, uh, Energy is always conserved. Uh, so if two proton, if proton and antiproton proton collide, they will emit other kinds of particles where the total energy that went into that then comes out mass. in other particles. Yeah. Uh, for example, an, an electron and anti-electron can annihilate to produce a uh, photon. Okay. So light. You can make light by hitting t- an, anti, an electron and anti-electron together. Yeah. Okay. But the, the real answer is we don't actually know what's going to come out of it when we do this. Um, we know there are certain things that we're looking for, certain theories that we have in mind that will complete our picture of the universe or make it make more sense. But we don't know what we're going to find. That's what's so exciting about it. That's what's so interesting. You talk to any of the scientists at Fermilab about what they do, and it won't be too long before you get to, yeah, I don't know. That's the answer. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea, which is what's exciting. I mean, it, which, which is what keeps them going, keeps them coming to work every day. Let me ask you something uh, right there where, uh, that kind of um, brought up a question in my mind. Is that part of the difficulty of um, funding mm-hmm. a facility like Fermilab? It absolutely is. Where yeah. like if a bunch of people come, show up, you know, and they're out wearing government badges and whatever, and they say, so what do you guys do here? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're, we're lucky in that we have uh, we have some, some legislators that are really behind what we do. Uh, there are some really supportive people in, in uh, locally and in Washington that uh, that know the value of basic science. But it is actually a, a part, of, part of what I run into all the time is people asking, you know, what is this going to do for me? How is this going to improve my life? And right, because ultimately taxpayer dollars mm-hmm. are, are what uh, funds the lab. Right. So the answer is really indirect in a lot of ways. I mean, what what I would say is that what we're what we're doing with the money is going after knowledge. We're going after the the, the expanding the knowledge of the human race. And here's what we know. Here's what we want to know. And here's the only way that we can get there. But what ends up happening when we do that is that we have to push all of these different types of technology forward. You know, computing technology, magnet mm-hmm. technology, you know, all of these things that that then go on to improve your life. Like the the technology that goes into the accelerators and particle physics is the same technology that goes into the MRI machine, goes into your PET scans, you know, all of these things that you find in hospitals everywhere. Accelerators are used around the world for a number of different purposes. They were developed for this. Um, So that's the type of thing that happens. And the other thing that I'll say is that accidental um, discoveries are really most of the time the ones that matter like the electron was discovered completely by accident in the 1890s that had no idea what they had and the electron is now powering everything that we're doing right now so all right yay electrons yeah so <laughs> so when we say we don't know that's true we have no idea but it could be that significant hmm. I think that this that pursuing fundamental knowledge of the universe sets the stage for improving people's lives at some other point yeah um one one of those ways is improved technology and another good example is uh einstein figured out general relativity in the early 1900s um if he hadn't gotten if he had needed a government grant to figure that out and then couldn't get it we wouldn't have gps today you need that for gps you need that for your cell phones to work Um, Mm. the other thing that hits home for me about being explorers of knowledge is Doing this and then sharing it with the people, sharing it with the people who want to just come say hi, sharing it with people who give us money, that plants the seeds for dreams of future scientists, for the people who are going to pick up where we leave off. Yeah. And mm-hmm. if we don't have that, then where are we going to where are we going to go after 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 we figure out what we figured out now? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, speaking of future scientists, you were once a future scientist. <laughs> I, I hope I still am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, how did you get into all this? What made you think I'm gonna I'm going to study the the cosmos? The cosmos? Uh, well, actually, in college, I used to make fun of my friend Christina Williams for studying astronomy because I was all into particle physics and string theory. I was like, oh, we could figure out how the work universe works at a fundamental level there. Nerdiest that- fight ever. <laughs> And now I now I don't really want to think about string theory at all. I'm not a big fan of it. But um, uh, and then years later in grad school, I saw a talk from Professor Tim McKay, at University of Michigan, and he was talking about these huge explosions in the universe that are even brighter and bigger than supernovae. They're called gamma ray bursts, and they have gas coming off them. Um, at uh, these, this is like this is large clouds of gas, like you would see around Earth, that are some fraction of the speed of light. 
And I said, I was like one of those five or 10 year old kids in the, in the audience that I talked to. And I was like, no way. And I was, I was hooked since then. Okay. Basically. And it didn't, it didn't hurt that in high school, I, I tried to understand how wormholes and uh, warp drives might work that I, I failed, but, but that was fun. Was that your project, your science project? <laughs> That's right. Step I'm, into my wormhole. <laughs> I'm actually doing this from multiple points in time, this interview right now. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, I had this uh, this teacher in high school who's so this Jesuit fella who um, he had a, he had a paunch that was you thought was specifically designed for him <laughs> to rest his arm on it, and he used to ask us these random questions like what is mass, and we'd all clamor to try to answer, and we'd all be wrong, um, and so I got kind of tired of that, so I just started doing projects to try to understand real stuff instead of mm-hmm. silly questions, mm. <laughs> or his silly sillily put questions. Okay. Um. How how often do you get into um, these um, discussions? I, I won't call them arguments, but I mean there there are a lot of people who are trying to um, you know uh, discredit uh, scientists and scientific knowledge, actual like scientifically based facts. You know, I mean it could be uh, you know uh, something about the the. the what's going on in outer space or climate or whatever, but it seems like there is an increase in distrust in scientific knowledge. Yeah. There, do, do you feel that? There's a severe anti-science sentiment in America right what, now. Wh- why? Why? I, I think it's a very complex question. I think some of the things that are at the root of it are there are some special interests that are able to um, influence at least superficially the superficial actions of some of our legislators and other people in um, and say celebrities and when and those people who have have big microphones and they in turn go back and convince their constituents or their their fans to to believe in a similar way and it's there it's hard to it's hard to challenge that with logic because they are at the on, at the face of it they are not wanting to engage logically. And so if I, you know, I try to say, you don't believe in climate change, that was based on science that we believe, then we understand and we know works. Do you not use a cell phone? It's the, you know, it's the same thing. Like science made these things and you can't really use one without the other without engaging in severe cognitive dissonance. Huh. Those are big words. <laughs> what about you, Andre? Uh, have you run into any pushback as far as you know? People find out that you work at a uh, you know a particle accelerator laboratory, and then they start giving you guff. Uh, no, actually, um, the this I, I'm not going to call it surprising because I, I know that Fermilab has a really good uh, um, relationship with our local community, and those are the people that I generally get to talk to is our, our local folks, and people come in and and they they're just wowed by what we do and you know explain what it's for and what we're doing and it, it's that's sort of the, the that's the impression that i get over and over is that people don't people don't grasp it at its most you know fine level but they do understand that it's it's impressive and important and it's 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 a it's an interesting thing to have in your backyard um yeah, no, I haven't had a lot of that pushback in my job at all. I mean, in my regular life, sure, there are people that that, that I know that that I've talked to that that don't uh, don't believe science and don't you know don't uh, yeah don't don't uh, come to the same conclusions that mm-hmm. I do when when you know data is presented and things like that. But in in my job, what is your I, response uh, when that happens? Uh, it just walking away a lot of time. <laughs> um, uh, it, it's, it's difficult. I mean, like, like Brian said, it is, it is difficult to, to come up with because your, your responses are going to be rooted in science. They're going to be rooted in like, here's what we found. Here's what we see, you know, and the, the, those responses aren't going to work with some people. So it's, mm. it's tough to do, but in my job, I have not come across that in my job. It's been, it's been actually really great uh, seeing the, the relationship that Fermilab has with folks and, and trying to keep that going, trying to keep people, you know, interested and excited in what we're doing. Mm-hmm. What, um, how does Fermilab feel about their, uh, their involvement in the community or how do you feel that you, you are, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is, do, are you happy with the percentage of people who know what you do and who are aware of what's going on at Fermilab? Of because not. no, because <laughs> I I think there are people who may be even lifelong citizens of Batavia and the surrounding communities that don't know what goes on there and don't know about all the different things that that even they can take advantage of at Fermilab because you know it's a fairly open place mm-hmm. and a lot of events. 
um, you know, wildlife Absolutely. and, and uh, you know, uh, ecology and stuff like buffalo. that. Lots yes, of buffalo. the buffalo yeah. is <laughs> very, very popular. Yeah, minimum once every couple of weeks, I will talk to somebody who says, I've lived here my whole life and I've never come. I've never visited. And wow. it's it's amazing to me. Um, it's it's a jewel that's just sort of sitting there. Um, the, the site is enormous. It's 6,800 acres. Quite a lot of it is restored prairie and, and woodland. And there, it, it, there's a natural beauty to the whole thing that even if you don't care what we're doing, uh, particle physics wise, you can come in and enjoy. There are people who come in just to fish for example we have mm -hmm. ponds for fishing and people come in just to do that they come in just to use our dog park or just to bird watch and that's great that's fantastic we love that people are able to to use the site for that mm -hmm. we're also really open about the science and what we do i mean we do a public tour every wednesday at 10 30 that will take you through um all of our different or a lot of our different facilities so you can take a look at what we're doing um give you a whole rundown of, of the different uh, science and experiments that we're putting together there um I'm happy to show people around whenever anybody wants that. Uh, we have um, more specific tours of specific things that are that are happening, and we do uh, lecture series that you know that we have um, visiting lecturers and also Fermilab lecturers um, who, for the public, will will talk at a uh, a level that people can understand uh, to uh, to explain their their research. Uh, we have an art series. Uh, Nellie Mackay and the Turtle Island Quartet were there last night, for example. And I don't know if you know Nellie Mackay, but she's fantastic. I I read the article in the paper, but I, I was I'm not familiar. So, yeah. did you attend that? I did. Yeah, I worked it. Um, she, I, I've been a fan for 15 years, maybe of her wow. of her stuff. Um, she's sort of this uh, funny jazz jazz folk um but really sarcastic sardonic really 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 funny uh, i'm not sure a lot of the people who came really expected that because we we, we build it as the turtle island quartet with nelly mckay and nelly was really the the draw she was the attraction so mm -hmm. uh, but people seem to enjoy it they seem to have a really good time so we do minimum one a month those we do a, a a concert or some some arts event we have an open house every year that people can come to it's usually in february um we have events like that um throughout the year we have coming up um, an annual um, STEM career fair for high school students where we bring high school students in and um, allow them to talk one-on-one -on -one with people who are in the science, technology, engineering, and math fields uh, just to, to get a feel for what it takes to get hired, uh, what it takes to get a career, and you know, what, what you should study when you go on to college. Yeah. And things or like even, that. is this something I want to do? Right, I'm exactly, sure. yeah. 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 Exactly. It's hard to know until you have been in it for a while. A lot of people end up not um, continuing either to grad school or after grad school because they realize that it's just not it's not what they want. Yeah. yeah. You do a lot of outreach, right, Brian? Uh, oh, yeah. Go out and uh, give lectures and talks and seminars and things like that? Yeah. What uh, Do you have any um, favorite stories as far as uh, something that comes to mind uh, on your travels? <laughs> um, I guess my the favorite uh, the favorite times are when there are very precocious children in the audience who try to answer questions before I ask them or um, <laughs> or are very quick to the draw. Those are those are some of the funnest days. Um, I'd have to I have to think about it a little more. Sure, yeah, some, give it some thought. Yeah. There's also a cemetery for me lab that you yeah. neglected. Yeah, Pioneer mention. Cemetery. Yeah. Right. yeah, cemetery. Mm -hmm. eh? yeah. Yep, I think our original director is buried there. Wilson. Yeah. Yep. Uh huh. Namesake of Wilson Wilson Hall. Hall. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Wow, I just learned something. Yep. <laughs> we also did a lot of the art that you see uh, on the Fermilab campus. So near the um, the reflecting pool at the front, there's this huge, I forget what it's obelisk called. Obelisk thing. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, obelisk that yeah. they designed. Mm -hmm. In okay. fact, everything on the site that looks like art is probably Wilson. Uh, he designed the whole site, too. So. Wow. Okay. Which nicely beckons to, a, to an era when scientists were... Um, well-rounded in that yes. way you know they could engage in their yes. creative side in a, in a different way besides in science yeah. I uh, believe uh, uh, one of the terms for that would be uh, to be a renaissance man right? Renaissance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have several of those at the laboratory Todd Johnson for example I would call sure. it a renaissance man Todd does a lot of, of interesting artwork and interesting um, uh, hands-on science for for kids he'll design just interesting things that they can mm -hmm. we, we there's an accelerator bowl that he designed for us that's basically magnets and a ball that's covered in lead but it works the same way that accelerators do with differently charged magnets and you turn it on and the ball goes around the edge of the the bowl and kids look at that like i have no idea how that's working and then you tell them and they're disappointed and sad and walk away because <laughs> 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 they thought it was magic but <laughs> Oh man! And there's Dan stuff. Hooper. He's a rock star. Dan Hooper is a rock star. So Dan Hooper is uh, one of our. Um, uh, he's a theorist working mainly with dark matter, uh, which is a, a huge hot topic right now, and um, 
Dan is also, uh, he goes by Charlie Wayne in a band called The Congregation that plays around Chicago a lot. They're sort of a, a soul rock band. They played mm. Fermi Lab a while back. Um, both Dan and his band were just featured in a BBC documentary uh, called Dancing in the Dark. It was on uh, BBC Two last week, I think. Mm. So. Okay. Yeah. Uh, exploring both their musical side and their scientific side. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. And, and the music is good? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're do they have a horn section? They do. Oh, yep. yes. <laughs> All right. Because when I, when I hear soul, you know, that's what I want to hear is Absolutely. some funky horn section. Yep. I They're need, quite good. I need to get out. Okay. Um, let's get back to Brian. Uh, dark energy. Mm. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> and why do we care? <laughs> it, it may help to start with saying what dark matter is because they're two completely different things. Mm, it, they sound related. They sound related, but uh, they're related through the word dark because they were both they were both discovered in eras when we just had no idea what the thing was that we were finding. Uh, dark matter is probably a particle, like uh, protons, neutrons, all that stuff. Um, it's just that it does one thing completely differently. It does not interact with light at all. So it can't reflect, emit light, so we can't see it directly. So we have to infer that dark matter exists. Um, and astrophysically, we've inferred that it exists in almost every scenario that where it's been obvious or where it's been detectable. Uh, dark energy, on the other hand, is a bit crazier, um, and it uh, we know quite a bit less about it. Um, it. It was discovered in 1998, and what it is is the simple fact that the um, the universe is not just growing, it's growing at an accelerated rate. So that means that uh, you and I are, even if we were, um, if we're not moving on our own two legs, if we were two galaxies, say, the space in between us is expanding, and it's expanding faster and faster, such that you and I will eventually be eons apart. Mm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Here comes the sadness. <laughs> so you might, so you would... In 50 billion years, you would definitely care about this in the, um, because groups of galaxies in 50 billion years will be so far apart and will be moving away from each other so fast that light will not be fast enough to move between them. So we will be, our, our small group of galaxies here, the Milky Way, Andromeda, and a few others, will coalesce into one mega galaxy and we will not be able to see any of the other mega galaxies throughout the universe. So we will be in a lonely island universe in 50 billion years, mm-hmm. most likely. Okay. Don't worry. Before that, <laughs> in 5 billion years, um, the, er, the sun will grow to its next phase, and its outer surface will envelop the, where the Earth is. And so we will have to have left long before that. Okay. Yeah. I'll start packing my bags. Yeah. yeah. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is the happy fun part of the, yeah. of the discussion. <laughs> All right, so dark energy, uh, the universe is expanding at an, at an accelerated rate. Uh, we are going to be alone, and we're going to be swallowed by the sun. And then <laughs> <laughs> shortly after that, everything goes into the black hole, right? Um, I went to which black hole? I don't yes. know. Yeah. Pick one. <laughs> Well, so there, a fun fact about black holes. This is one of the things that might, make, <laughs> that might make you feel better. Okay. Okay. So take the uh, sun right now. So the sun is not massive enough to become a black hole. You have to have a really massive thing to collapse on itself. But if you were to replace the sun with a black hole, what do you think would happen? Well, I suppose um, everything around it gets sucked into it, right? Isn't that what happened? Right. So I'm glad we have so many people listening today because I can destroy that concept. Oh. It's the black hole will just, it'll just be there and we will just keep going around it as we did around the sun. The only thing that'll be missing is all the light. Yeah, and so, the energy and so the we'll heat. Be dead. Yeah, and, so, yeah, yeah, so we, we'll, we won't get sucked in. We will die, but we won't get sucked in. So black holes aren't vacuums. It's just that once you go beyond a certain point towards its center, you can't get out. But it doesn't actively suck you in other any light mm. um, any differently than any other planetary body. Yeah, I mean, I guess I always thought of black holes as being like a giant vacuum, right? Yeah. Like it just definitely not. So hmm. feel better. Yeah. <laughs> All I can think of is that old coffee commercial. We've secretly switched your son with a black hole. <laughs> Let's see if they notice. I can't. <laughs> no, that was for um, Sanka, Sanka, right? Sanka, the yeah. fake coffee. Yeah. Instant uh-huh. coffee. Yeah. 
<laughs> um, okay, so black holes. Um, what happens when you get into the black hole? Though? Like, do you come mm. out? So I just watched Interstellar again. Okay, um, I haven't was... seen it probably because I'm afraid to <laughs> of the giant um, anxiety attack that I would then go through. Oh, you you would be you'd be too excited to be seeing the, yeah, the universe pass by. Anyway, um, <laughs> the uh, what ha what happens when you go into a black hole is the the gravity. If you picture a funnel and you're going into the black hole down the funnel, as you um, as you go deeper and deeper, the strength of gravity at different points as you go down is very, very different. So you have one gravity here, still pulling you down, but once one, one piece of space here pulling you and then another piece there, but they're pulling you at such different amounts that it would first uh, kind of squish you into a spaghetti tube and then it would pull those spaghetti tubes apart. And then it would, <laughs> and then it would keep doing that in each of your sections as they flow down. So you would be sort of ripped to shreds hmm. as you go down. Science. <laughs> Science is fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I was afraid of something like that. <laughs> but we never we've never sent a probe into any black hole. We only we were only really, really sure um about the about one black hole which is at the center of our galaxy because we've seen there's basically empty space there and you can watch stars over periods of years and uh orbit around it. So that's the one that we know exists, but it's way too far away for us to even try to send a satellite to yet. Right. Well, even if you sent one in, it wouldn't survive, right? It would just be destroyed. And well, there's still shreds, debate, right? actually. So Stephen Hawking is still debating with a lot of people about how information, um, what happens to information when it goes in and when it tries to come out. And there, it, it's still not known for sure if it would be possible to retrieve information from something that went in. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Andre, anything to add? Uh, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Interstellar is a very good movie. Mm. I read an article in Wired Magazine about uh, Interstellar and about uh, the making of it, and um, they had a, uh, a physicist who was a... Uh, Kip Thorne. Yeah, Kip Thorne was uh, the uh, consultant as far as the science bits, mm -hmm. and it seemed like they took it really you know, as, as, as seriously as possible in terms of trying to make it accurate to what we know. Yeah. Wasn't that one that Neil deGrasse Tyson didn't have a lot of problem with? Yeah, surprisingly. He yeah. usually can tear things to shreds. I mean, he pointed out where things are... Um, not uh, you know, it's possible, but not likely that that would is how things would go. For example, there's a, there's a huge black hole, and there there are supposedly planets orbiting around it. That's a that's a hard sell for a scientist. It's possible, <laughs> but it's a hard sell. Well, ultimately, it is a motion picture and yes. not a lecture. Sure. So you know there are, you know they might have to do a couple of things, but uh, it sounded like they they placed the science uh, very uh, first and foremost in 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 that production. So. Yeah. All right. As best you can with any time travel film. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you give it out of a 10? Oh, um, I was or in my seat the whole time. I, I'm going to have to give it a nine and a half at least. Ooh. Yeah, I really liked it about nine. Okay. Like yeah, yeah, I thought it was great. I, I do always wonder about the, the science uh, consultants on things like that because it, it seems to me that what they would have to do is say, this is our story. Tell us how this works. Not how something else would work, but how this very thing we want to do right. works. And so it seems like they would probably just disregard the advice that makes this not work. No, not so, necessarily. Is that um, true? Okay. That, that article that I read, um, I think uh, there was some challenging points back and forth. And then I, I, I recall them saying at one point, uh, Kip Thorne ex absolutely put his foot down and said, you, can't, you cannot do this. Hmm. Oh, cool. <laughs> Interesting. Good. Yeah. So maybe get, go back and give that one a yeah, read. Yeah, I'd like but, to read uh, that. It was good. Yeah. So... Uh, um, what else do we need to talk about? I saw something in your bio about you spending time in Chile. Oh, yeah. You want to tell us about that? That sounds pretty cool. So, yeah, a couple weeks, sometimes a few months during the year, um, I get to go down to use the telescope. So this, this dark energy crazy thing, the, the best way that we have to explore what this might be is to look at patterns of celestial objects. Like, you know, if we, if we can measure or detect a few hundred million galaxies across the universe, the pattern, their spatial pattern, will tell us how dark energy is changing or what dark energy is doing to us. So um, the Dark Energy Survey was put online in 2012. And we've been taking images of the sky ever since, and this is located on a mountaintop called the uh, Serra Tololo Inter-American Observatory um, in the Andes. And there, this uh, $50 million beauty scans the sky every night trying to get, trying to find supernovae and galaxies. So mm -hmm. they send uh, they send people like me and 
many of the other 300 scientists on the project to go and man the telescope for a couple of nights in a row. Hmm. 570 megapixel, is that right, right. for the camera? Mm -hmm. Your phone has about eight, right? So. Yeah, eight, ten. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so we built that camera at Fermilab and, and tested it there. It's uh, We think it's the most powerful digital imaging device in the world. But at least for astronomy, who knows yeah. what the NSA has. That's true. But <laughs> <laughs> um, Where did the funding for this uh, telescope come from? The majority of it was from the Department of Energy. Mm -hmm. um, there are other contributions to operations and the building of the telescope from um, other countries. I think STFC in the UK contributed, um, Brazil contributed, um, as well as Spain, and then NSF helps with the operations. It's the National Science Foundation. Okay. And so um, you get to interact with uh, with these scientists from all the different uh, countries. And oh, yeah. You guys uh, do your math calculations and stuff. <laughs> That's right. Carry the one. That's what we do. We say, hey, guys, want to go do some math calculations? Let's, let's meet let's up. Let's go do some let's math. Come <laughs> uh, twice, twice a year, the entire collaboration of like 20 institutions or so gets together in some place. So one, one time per year, it's in somewhere in the U.S. Another time of the year, it's in um, somewhere out of the U.S. And we all get together to... Um, where everyone is working like a dog in between, especially right now, because we have a lot of data that's just come out that we're trying to crunch. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a constant stream of collaborative activities. And this is a bit different than what it used to be uh, in astronomy, because you used to go um, somewhat, you would apply for telescope time, go get your data, and then you could let it sit as long as you wanted on your shelf. And you just, it's, for you to publish or not. Mm -hmm. uh, now, these questions are so big and require such resources that we are forced to work together. And scientists are not always seen traditionally as being you know, good communicators, but we're, we're getting better and better and better. Yeah, this is actually a good point because that's how our entire field is going. Particle physics is now a global thing. And it, it's to the point where um, we've got sort of different regions of the world working on different things, different aspects uh -huh. of, of science that are complementary, that will that will you know improve each other's results. So we're not going to be working on the same things that they're working on at the Large Hadron Collider. We're going to be working on uh, neutrinos, which is the, you know, the particles, the tiny ones that can go through anything that we study in Minnesota, sending them through the Earth. We're going to be working on that largely for the next 25 years as sort of our, our flagship thing and almost nobody else is going to be I mean nobody else is going to be doing it the way we're going to be doing it and our results are going to be complementary to the things that are going on in Japan mm -hmm. things that are going on in Europe and that's uh that sounds like um you know a good way to go about things because you're not duplicating efforts you're right. not wasting money because you know uh you would imagine that uh you guys would come up with the same results anyway right so yeah. Although that's an important tenet of the scientific process. Um, this kind of gets back earlier to what we we're talking about, about why there maybe is anti-science attitude. And it's just that there is um, the scientific process in, in a lot of ways is very subtle. Uh, but one of the one of the fundamental tenets is to um, that your wh whatever you produce has to be repeatable. Mm. And so a lot of experiments do need to be repeated. Uh, the, when the Tevatron was running, there were two experiments that were doing the same data analysis in different ways. So they could, because if you get one, you better, you better be able to confirm it with something else. LIGO, the, I forget exactly what the, um, what the acronym means, but it's this thing that in the coming years is probably going to detect gravitational waves. Right. And um, these are from these spinning neutron stars that when they clash together, they actually make waves in space time. And we have more, we have two facilities for this in the US and you need both of those to make sure that if one signal, if you get signal somewhere, then you gotta make sure you got it in the other place. This is the same thing at the Large Hadron Collider too, where the, the Atlas and CMS experiments are the ones that are sort of like the ones that we had on our Tevatron, where they're looking for the same thing in different ways and they come up with complementary results. So they both announced the Higgs boson discovery in 2012 together. Mm -hmm. Waves in space time, is that what you just said? No. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Oh, pretty badass <laughs> you guys are killing me oh man so um i don't know I, I, i'm gonna go ahead i'm gonna you know play the role of um fairly ignorant um commoner here and uh <laughs> citizen i guess i don't yes, know yes please cat please keep casting me in the ivory tower that will help yes. <laughs> <laughs> but um you know what? Uh, what could you tell someone like me about what you're doing and um, and and why I care? 
you know i mean i know we talked a little bit about it earlier but um you know i'm not asking you to to justify yourself <laughs> but maybe i am i don't know i think that no, it's, it's a fair point uh, in that i use resources um that you contribute that and, and i don't do anything that is obviously tangible necessarily obviously tangible and um i want to go back to the point when we were talking about feeling small uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson has one of my favorite commentaries on this, and he says, it's a, it's a great video, I can send you the link later. Um, usually people feel, he says, usually people feel small when they look up at the, at the sky and they think they're insignificant because they're just a small piece of it. But if you remember that um, everything that we're made of was once inside a star. This is in the, in the early universe when stars were forming just from hydrogen gas, they would eventually get so large and um, then they would explode and spew out their guts into the universe. And in the process, they would create the elements that are higher, that are more massive than hydrogen, like helium and lithium and things like that. Mm. Um, and once you realize, once I realized that just because I exist, I am a part of that entire cosmic opera. I, I might feel small, but I feel like I'm a part of something just because I'm here. And for me, that's that's more than enough to get up in the morning and keep doing this. Um, to, to your point or your question about why it matters to you, that that's part of it because I think that science can be a, a real human bonding exercise. It can be something that brings us together if we, um, if we all engaged in a, a modicum of curiosity and a certain level of wanting to know about each other, maybe through science, um, and know about how we work through science. I think that that is that's a uniting thing. Hmm. Very well said. Hmm. We are all made of stars. Science is a uniter, not a divider. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Andre, aren't you, you going to ask anything to add? What's wrong with you? <laughs> I was thinking it. <laughs> no, I think I think Brian said that really well. Um, uh, I I love talking to scientists about why they get up in the morning and come in and keep doing this and and, and what motivates them. And often it's just to be able to to contribute a tiny bit to this continuum of science that's been you know throughout the entire human race. Like we didn't th things that we didn't know you know uh, uh, thousands of years ago that have you know that we were built on that now we're building on the knowledge that's been gained now and and for for uh, for scientists to make just sort of a tiny contribution a tiny mark in that is 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 pretty mm -hmm. amazing actually it's it's like a, a, a river that you get to have this you know tiny little contribution to it's yeah i imagine that it takes a special kind of person though because there are certain scientific discoveries that are very concrete right like i created a light bulb Mm -hmm. you know, or whatever, or, you know, I discovered x-rays. But again, these are things you know. that happen by accident too, when you're going for something right. else. Like you didn't set out to make a light bulb, you know? It's, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but you know, I mean, there, there are certain areas where you go into thinking, okay, uh, I'm either going to succeed or I'm going to fail at doing this one thing. Whereas this is so much more theoretical and possibly unknowable. I don't know. Oh, so a, a winding way, basically. You're saying, yeah, so science is a process of fits and starts. It is not, it is not clean until, until you've already like written all of your programming code and, it's, and you know what's going to happen with it. It's, it's, a, it's a process where you try something, it doesn't work, but you have the foundation of what was known before you to make the best hypotheses and guesses possible. And there's... Um, Without knowing the future, there's no real other way to go about this. Yeah, mm -hmm. and when when an experiment doesn't turn up what you think it's going to, that's not a failure in any way. That's you, you've come up with a result. It's a negative result. It's it says this is not what we were looking for. Let's look somewhere else. Mm -hmm. That's important too. That's absolutely usually important. Yeah, there's a, the, the only bad experiment is the one that that um, fails to uh, answer any question. Mm -hmm. So answering, uh, asking a question and getting getting a no is almost as good in a lot of cases. Getting a yes, and when we when we talk about this meandering route that we take, we always, uh, at least, to, much more so today with these big experiments, when we when we're spending so many people's money, we're careful to make sure that we know that we are going to get closer to some answer that we're looking for, even if it doesn't take us over the edge. We know that we're going to go a large step closer to mm -hmm. something. 
All right. <laughs> no, it's it's very cool, and and I am uh, I'm. I'm very impressed by uh, by you personally, Brian, and uh, and by your your coworkers as well, and uh, and Andre uh, helping to uh, translate all of this fun stuff uh, for the rest of us. But um, you know, keep doing what you're doing. Um, don't don't cause any black holes, <laughs> <laughs> and and we'll be fine. But um, yeah, any. Uh, I do want to reserve a few minutes to talk a little bit about music. Okay. But um, any closing thoughts on uh, on Fermilab in in general? Come or... visit us. Yeah. Yeah. Come come see what we're about. We're we're we're. How do we get in touch with you? Um, well, the the best way to uh, the the best way to to, to uh, the site is open every day from eight a.m. to to six p.m. I believe next month it's going to change from eight a.m. to eight p.m. So it's you can come visit whenever you want. Um, you can call uh, the our office uh, to, to at six three zero eight four zero three three five one or uh, Fermilab at fnal.gov if you want to get in touch with somebody in our office that can help you out uh, with questions. Um, um, but seriously, just come. Just uh, you know, you don't. It, there's a guard at the gate, but the guard is just there. To, uh, you show them a photo ID. You say, "I'm going to go see Wilson Hall or something," and they will let you right in. I mean, it's okay. it's a public site. You're you're meant to come on um, Wednesdays at 10:30. Are the uh, that's the the public tour um, that will get you a, a nice primer as to everything that's going on. And we do a, an event called Ask a Scientist every month too. It's the first Sunday or Saturday or Sunday, I forget which, uh, of every month. But all that information is on our website, which, by the way, is fnal.gov. Uh, and so for the Ask a Scientist event, you get to, to come take a tour and mingle with scientists and just ask them anything you want. And <laughs> that's always a really well-attended event. It's always a lot of fun. So yeah, we, we try to be as open as we possibly can. I mean, I know there's there's uh, a perception uh, around uh, that I've talked to people that have that, that they don't quite know what's happening at Fermilab and they're, they're a little worried that, about the fact that they don't know what's happening there. But everything that's happening there is is open to the to the public. We're, we're more than happy to talk about anything that we're doing. And the guard is not armed, is he? No, he none have of our guards guard. are armed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe that's where some of the intimidation might be coming from, but no, he's not armed. Nope. So nope. feel free. Yeah, we don't do any of the type of work that, say, for example, Argon does. Argon's guards are armed. Um, we don't do any of that. Uh -huh. so. We just smash particles. Yep. Do you, do you guys have, is there like a bit of a natural rivalry? Are you guys like in a softball league against Argon? You would think, but I no, wish. right? That would be pretty awesome. Yeah, I, but, it would but be pretty great. Drive time, I think, just between those parts of Chicago. And we, we work too much already. I just think that's not <laughs> I mean, we, we, National Laboratories, uh, there are 17 of them, uh, DOE Office of Science National Laboratories, and we're all really good at talking to each other and working with each other. You know, we'll, we'll go to conferences together. And so mm -hmm. the, the rivalry isn't, isn't, I think we need to drum something up. It would be though. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Can we can we have some kind of a competition and invite Argon to you know to a challenge? Absolutely. I, 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 yeah. I say that people from Argon should come on your show. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And Actually, then, I know. And then what? Yeah. <laughs> and then, <laughs> no, I mean I want like a direct competition. Oh. Oh. You okay. Know, Science Bowl or something. Science Quiz Bowl. Quiz Bowl. Quiz Bowl. Mm -hmm. Right here. Yeah. Yeah. Once and for all. Argon Schmargon. Whose science reigns supreme? Anyway. <laughs> All right. So uh, Fermilab, I highly recommend it. Uh, we've been to a couple of the uh, the open houses. Uh, been to, oh, and just this past week, actually, um, uh, my wife is a teacher in Geneva at an elementary school, and they uh, had their fun fair. And as part of the fun fair, Mr. Freeze uh, made a, an appearance at the school, so actually ventured out into the community. And uh, blew a bunch of stuff up and froze a bunch of stuff. He's a, a cryogenic scientist at Fermilab. Yep, Jerry Zimmerman is his name. He's very cool bad. dude and um, likes to make a mess, and the kids love it. So if you have not seen Mr. Freeze in action, make sure that you uh, get. <laughs> and I think those are um, like you don't schools don't have to pay for him. I don't think to come schools out. Schools don't have to pay for anything that we do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if you are, um, you know, an educator or an administrator in a local school district and uh, are looking for a very uh, fun scientific presentation for your school, highly recommend Mr. Freeze as well. So, all right. So uh, music time. <laughs> <laughs> Andre's like, fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, Andre. Yes. For those of uh, actually for those of our uh, watchers, watchers, uh, viewers and listeners uh, who may not uh, know. Andre is uh, 
he he is very into music. Sort of. <laughs> and that's kind of an understatement. <laughs> but uh, he writes about music on a, uh, do you have a set schedule? Is it like a once a week? It's or? once a week. Yeah. Okay, so a weekly blog at uh, tm3am.com, which it. stands for Tuesday morning, 3 a.m. Uh, although... It sounds like Tuesday is might not be the release date. Yeah, that's what what's, I'm hearing. What's going on with that? Now? So I mean that that that's a really. I have a lot of thoughts about that. So uh, uh, historically, historically, um, it's been, new albums come out on Tuesdays in this country. Historically, yes, in the United historically States. in the UK, it's Mondays. Uh, historically, in uh, other countries, it's been Fridays. So any reason for that? It, they just the country set their own dates. Okay. So uh, the the idea now is to create a global release date of Friday so that everybody's putting their records out at the same time so that there's no it's supposed to cut down on piracy on on leaks as if that one day lead time between the uk and the us is what's causing the problem like if (laughs) if i don't get like the new kendrick lamar album one day early (laughs) there will be no piracy right that's it's totally silly to me okay so, release dates don't even matter anymore. It's it's not even a thing, you know. Um, it, all records, generally, all the all the records that I know of are leaked early. You know, a lot of the, the bands do it themselves. They'll put it online like two weeks early. Here it is. You know, Kendrick is a really good example because that came out just randomly on a Sunday on iTunes. Like, ah, yeah, here it is. Yeah, just hit yeah. the button and there it is. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Like you two. Oh well, yeah. The. Well, I, I, okay, Brian, feel free to interview. Um, oh, sorry. No, go, no, go ahead. No, you're a co-host. <laughs> Lean in, man. No, no. Oh, I, I, I welcome that. No, no, go for it. Ask him. Ask him oh, a question. I, I just, that made me think of the U2 release when they just yeah. added it to everyone's iTunes. Certainly, yeah, which was a surprise release as well. Surprise releases are becoming the thing. And I, I read something uh, just recently, too, which made me pretty happy because I'm a... I'm an albums guy, right? I'm, I'm the guy that really likes the, the full album... Uh, experience, experience yeah. right? The beginning to end, you know, th- it's meant to be consumed as a whole sort of thing. And that's coming back because of this in a lot of ways, because the the, the way that, that iTunes originally was, was set up was, you know, a track by track sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And it was dollar become, a song, right? Dollar a song. So it was becoming sort of like the, the digital distribution method was a single song. Now it's becoming, you've got to hear the entire record to be part of the conversation as it's happening. Right. So Beyonce was one of the first people to do it, put it entire record out uh, uh, randomly on iTunes just as a surprise and you've got to hear the whole thing in order to comment on it uh, you two presented an entire record to everybody who owns iTunes and it, it became about the album experience now wh- when you say you have to listen to the whole whole record you mean like that's the only way they no, it's not the only way that you can experience it. But if you want to be part of the cultural conversation that's okay. happening about it, that's what it hmm. is. The conversation's about the album, which um, is in direct contrast to some of the the theories of you know the death of the album. Yeah, basically over the past exactly know, however many years. Uh, huh, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, so I'm happy about that. Good. <laughs> yeah. Um, Brian, do you have now? See, when I start thinking about that kind of stuff, I start thinking Desert Island Discs. You know, mm-hmm. like you have that oh. handful of albums. You know, you can only take five or ten albums with you to be stranded, and these are the only things you can listen to for the rest of your life. You know, so yes. um, you know, what are some of those for you? If if you had to just throw a couple out there, um, let's see, Deltron Thirty Thirty. Oh yes, one of my favorite sets, Della Funky Homo Sapien and Danny Automator came out 10 15 years ago more than that 20 yes yeah. it's, it's awesome okay, i don't um, even know <laughs> black alicious does a lot of good stuff i probably want to keep their uh, a to g um let's see maybe some bt mm. um and uh definitely got thrown some streisand or some uh sh- chicago air supply <laughs> yeah yeah he's actually unironically a fan of streisand chicago and air supply i I, I enjoy me. I don't know yeah. that they would make my Desert Island discs, but <laughs> I'm a big fan of the Air Supply. Yeah. They're on my uh, Guilty Pleasure playlist. Yeah. I don't feel guilty. Yeah. <laughs> no guilt whatsoever. And that's another thing to talk about, too. There's no such thing as a Guilty Pleasure. Oh, uh, there kind of is. No. Like what you like. No. And, don't feel and guilty. I, th- I, I think that you are musically liberated n- enough to feel <laughs> that way, but for some of us, it's like, all right. Uh, Last time I was here, the two of us jammed to Boston's third stage from beginning yes, to end. Unapologetically. Unapologetically. Like what you like. Yes. <laughs> and I'm not saying that you should feel shame, per se, but I'm saying, you know, uh, to me, the definition of a, a 
a guilty pleasure is you're in your car and you're like screaming your head off and then you look over and someone like sees you do that and you're just like oh man <laughs> i can't believe that just happened <laughs> but uh yeah i don't know i mean i i, I get it i i'm i will never make f- well i shouldn't say that <laughs> <laughs> i might make fun of somebody for something that they're listening to but uh but that that usually doesn't stop me mm-hmm. but it, it's just it's a certain category of music Anyway, Kenny Chesney. No, no, I don't. I yeah. Don't get me started on the whole new <laughs> pop country. New, country. new pop country. I'm I'm pretty much not on board with. Yeah, you know, I'm either. much more of a Johnny Cash, Merle Haggard, Willie Nelson, yes. Hank Williams kind of a guy. Yeah. Why was it such a seismic shift when Taylor Swift decided to go pop? She's been pop the entire time. Yeah. Although, right. I mean, sort of country, right? but that yeah. was, you know, like country. Yeah, it was a different flavor. I mean, it was definitely country ish. Right. Yeah, <laughs> it was. I mean, that that was her. You know, if you think of it as her uh, her her path to the major leagues, you know, you could go this way. You could go that yeah. way. And that's sort of what it is. Yeah. You know, I mean, you could say the same thing about Shania Twain before that. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Because she was, you know, had more of a country flavor and then just kind of blended into the mainstream stuff sure yeah brian anything to add (laughs) 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 i'm trying to keep you awake man um okay so no from brian uh andre what's going on this year with uh music it's been really good so far this year i'm I'm surprised we're in month number three so far yeah and i've already got a pretty good top 10 list so wow so now there's bumping going on yeah as far as all the new good so the the ones that i'm enjoying most um uh i mentioned kendrick earlier the the kendrick lamar album that came out last week is monumental um i'm still trying to digest it but i think we'll be talking about this record in 10 20 years really still yeah i do that's a bold statement Mm -hmm. yeah i i it's it's monumental um so i'm i'm having a little trouble uh, getting a handle on what I want to say about it, but it's it's something that I've been listening to a lot. Um, the the album that's still probably clinging to the number one spot for me is the Punch Brothers. Okay. Um, the Punch Brothers put an album, uh, an album called the Phosphorescent Blues. Um, I just saw them in Chicago uh, a few weeks ago, and they were extraordinary. So they're they're a bluegrass band uh, or standard bluegrass lineup that plays almost everything but bluegrass. You know, they'll <laughs> they'll do <laughs> they 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 do like the the, the album starts with a ten minute progressive rock song played on bluegrass instruments, um, and it, it moves into you know this. Uh, they do a Debussy piece on on. On, on most acoustic instruments, they do pop songs. They have a drummer for the first time on this record to, for, for the, the popular material. And, and it's really, it, it's, they're virtuosos, but it doesn't ever come off that way. There's no jamming at all. It's just really great songs okay. played really well by incredibly talented people. Uh, there's a band called Quiet Company that put on an album called Transgressor that uh, is extraordinary. That's fantastic stuff. Hmm. Um, I just reviewed Stephen Wilson's new album, which is excellent. Um, there's a lot happening. There's a lot that you um, talk about that I, I don't even know. You know, it's like uh, you t- I think people tend to get, uh, you know, they have their bands that they know about, right? And it's yeah. the bands that kind of get shoved down your throat on the radio and you know, whatever. And so, uh, you know, what would be your tips for someone like me who needs to expand horizons a little bit, you know? I mean, I'm not against music I don't know. Right. But it seems like it takes a little bit of effort to get there, you know. So if you had to give a, a handful of tips to uh, someone who wanted to be a more adventurous listener, what would you say? Well, I would say that the Internet has made it a lot easier to try things for free. Uh, mm-hmm. And so just try as much stuff as you can. You know, read reviews, read, you know, uh, read articles about things that and if they sound interesting to you, just call them up on YouTube or go on Spotify and just listen. I mean, it, it's it, back in my day, it certainly was not that easy. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Get off my lawn, kids. But it, it, it absolutely was not that easy. You know, you'd read about something and you'd have to go buy it if you wanted to hear it right. and and there was there was no other outlet except your local radio station and they didn't play most of the stuff that you wanted to hear right. you know i discovered ben folds five almost entirely by accident <laughs> it was a recommendation from somebody that i had no idea what it would sound like and it, ben folds is one of my favorite musicians mm-hmm. full stop so i don't know where i would have heard that before brick you know brick suddenly was you know, that was the thing yeah, everybody heard the place. yeah and i might not have even tried it had i heard brick because i don't really like that song and 
and where the, it's kind of a depressing song. Yeah, it's yeah, <laughs> just a wee bit. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't it doesn't give you the scope of what they're about either. It doesn't give you the scope of what he can do, whereas the album yeah. does. Um, kind of like uh, more than words for extreme. I- exactly right. Yeah, that doesn't give you any idea of what pornography is going to be like. Yeah, right. I we're big extreme fans. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah we extreme. should have warned you beforehand. Extreme. <laughs> <laughs> um, Who's extreme? But I think it's it's far easier oh. now. I think you know it's far easier to just try stuff and sample it. Do how do we feel about online streaming services? Now I've heard good things and bad things. Uh, you know, good things obviously being just about everything is available at little or no cost. Mm-hmm. The bad thing being that artists totally get hosed on yep. on earnings. Yep. So, so if I, I I'm the sort of person where if I like something I'm going to buy it. I'm going to give money and if if I can buy it directly from the band I'm also going to do that. That's the only way that I can I can feel like a responsible music listener, right? Is if I follow the bands directly and give them money whenever I can. Mm-hmm. Um, Should I, I feel bad about using a service like uh, Rhapsody or Spotify or Pandora? Well, that's or up whatever. to you if you want to feel bad. I can, I'm I, asking you. I mean, I feel bad, but that's it's it's up to you if you want to. I mean, the 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 fact of it is that the artists get virtually nothing for giving their songs to Spotify. So if that is all you do, if you pay a Spotify, you know, a monthly Spotify fee and you just listen to whatever you want from that, you're not actually supporting the artists you're listening to. Mm. And that's, you know, that's, that's up to you whether you want to feel bad about that or not. I mean, it's incredibly convenient. It, it opens up your vistas to, you know, brand new stuff that you've never experienced before. Those are good things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But you're saying take the extra step and go to the band's website and purchase the album after you discover them on. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that's yeah. what I do. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. Fair enough. And if you can't get it directly from the band's website, you should go straight to kiss the sky record kiss store the sky in Batavia. In Batavia. <laughs> the best record store in the suburbs without a doubt. Yeah. Say hi to Steve and tell him we sent you. Um, okay. So, uh, We've gone over our time, but I wanted to ask you one more thing about music, Andre. Sure. Um, disappointments. Hmm. Have you been disappointed yet this year? Um. Something that <laughs> should have been good but wasn't. Uh, see, I, t- I tend to forget those, so I have to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> we had a disappointment pretty early on, and I can't remember what it was um, because I haven't listened to it since. Hmm. So um, it's been a lot more positive this year than it's been, you know, uh, than it's been a disappointing experience. Um, yeah, even like the new Noel Gallagher album is better than I thought it would be. I thought it would be awful, so it didn't have to work very hard to be better than I thought it would be. <laughs> but yeah, have you set the bar low? Yeah, yeah right, yeah. right. But um, yeah, no, um, Guster, that was it. the The new Guster oh, okay. album is terrible. Bad. The new Guster album is a, a crushing, horrible disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I I was physically pained listening to it. How do you it. really feel about it? I think it's pretty bad. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so thumbs down. Yeah, a thumbs down for the Guster record. And I'm a fan. I I like that band. I just haven't. I mean, I've watched them devolve over four or five albums to the point where they are now. And you kind of flippantly said something, but I I totally get what you're saying. Where you actually when you when you are a fan like that and you're disappointed it actually registers as it physical hurts. pain, doesn't it? It physically hurts. Yeah, yeah. I feel bad. That's how I felt when I listened to that uh, Pink Floyd album that I bought earlier this year. Yeah. Or was that last year? Yeah, that was a mess. (laughs) (laughs) Seriously, man. I mean, I was really, really bummed out about that. Plus, I ponied up for the vinyl as well. Mm -hmm. That was like 40 bucks. Yeah. And I think I gave it to somebody. (laughs) I did. I was just like, get this out of my house. I haven't listened to that since I wrote about it. (sighs) Very disappointing. Yeah, see, if you use Spotify... (laughs) <laughs> you would know how You're, disappointing it yeah, is before I could have just, you know, I could have just went on the BitTorrent yeah. and, and downloaded it. And I'm I'm really not um, worried about Pink Floyd getting money from Spotify. I think they're okay. <laughs> I think they're going to make it. So. <laughs> I think. <laughs> All right. Um, anything coming up music-wise here over the next couple of months that we should get excited about? Yeah, Sufjan Stevens is next week. Um, I, I love Sufjan. Um, that, that I'm really looking forward to. Death Cab for Cutie is also next week. That's uh, the last record that they they um, will make with their guitarist, Chris Walla, who's been a huge part of their sound. Um, 
Uh, I have an album coming to me from an artist called Timber that I, I paid for about two years ago. Um, I love crowdfunding. I'm a huge fan of okay, it. So, so this I, is like a Kickstarter type thing? Yeah. Or? So at Kickstarter, Indiegogo, Pledge Music, things like that. I pledge to those things all the time um, because it's a way of getting the money directly to the band. And I love the idea of getting in early, right? And saying like, here's money to help make this thing that you wouldn't otherwise get. So I'm my contribution is helping, is helping to bring something into the world that wouldn't exist otherwise. I love that. The only downside is the long wait times. I really did pay for this two years ago, and it really is coming to me in a couple of weeks. <laughs> but I'm actually really excited about it. Wouldn't it be cool though if it uh, if it worked the same as compound interest? You know, like mm-hmm. maybe you paid for it two years ago, and now you're going to get like two and a half albums. That would be great. One. It is a double record if that's helpful. But what? hey, <laughs> hey, hey. Oh. <laughs> are you using a wormhole? Yeah, <laughs> man. I'm here from the future. All right. So, uh, and will we see you at the Grateful Dead show this summer? Probably not. <laughs> but, uh, I, sh- I should point out, if I go see music, it's generally local. It's generally the local bands. There's a really great scene around the area that you should definitely be supporting. Uh, there's a band called Noah's Arcade coming out with a new record in a couple of weeks. Mm. Um, that um, I liked their first record. They're a, a, a strong, uh, strong group. So I would, uh, yeah. It, Kevin Trudeau's album is coming out very shortly. I can't uh, objectively talk about that because yes, I'm part of it. You, you were one of the musicians featured. Yeah, so that's that's a record that's definitely going to be worth your time. All right. I will write the review of that one, and then you can post it on your website. That would be great. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I, I would not I would not even pretend to be able to, to do that because it takes a special – it's a skill, uh, uh, criticism. I mean, not just like you know, pick up your underwear. I mean, that's criticism. <laughs> I'm talking about like creative criticism. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not suggesting that your underwear is on the floor right now, but, you know. It is. Okay. <laughs> See, I guessed it again. <laughs> Wormhole. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, the wheels are coming off, so we should probably wrap it up here. But uh, anything else that we need to get to that we uh, that you thought of? Any good stories? Did not. Okay. I was too focused on trying to understand Andre's perspective on music. <laughs> He's like a theoretical physicist to a non-physicist. Yeah. Like, May- I, about his view on music, it's it's amazing. Wow. We should take Thank you. Um, two pieces of music and smash them together and yeah, see what higher and higher energy see if we can get better pieces of music out of it yeah <laughs> okay yeah I think that's Walk gonna do this it way. all right um, let's just uh, end it here um, thank you so much to Brian Nord and to Andre Sauls both of uh, Fermilab and uh, I've, we've got some links to their websites here on Facebook darkenergydetectives.org tm3am.com music and science together again it's a beautiful thing you guys are like Smokey and the Bandit no uh, no they were actually hated each other um, Jake and Amir we are Jake and Amir Jake and Amir mm-hmm. that's right we we'll post the link to that later too right <laughs> no yes sure so thank you uh, ladies and gentlemen for watching and listening as well I think uh, Marissa Amoni checked in there at one point and I said that we were going to get to her, but um, she already got plenty of airtime last week. So <laughs> Take that, Amoni. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, Carrie Kraus is out there listening. Hi, Carrie. Um, and uh, keep your eyes open. I don't have uh, the next uh, episode scheduled as of yet, but I'm sure it is going to be almost as fabulous as this one. So uh, keep your eyes peeled. Uh, follow us on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube at Fox Valley Voice. And uh, we will see you next time.